Right. Hi, I'm Kristen Cronin. I'm, I think I'm Kristen Cronin the Flom. I just haven't really taken on to the married name yet, but I should soon. Um, <laughs> really working on it. Um, so I am the Vice President of People, Culture, and Communications over at Localytics, um, which is a relatively newer role for me. So I took on the kind of people side of things back in the spring after coming from like a marketing background. So not the usual path to people management, but it's been really um, very interesting and very rewarding to kind of learn that side of the business. And then I ended up taking back marketing in the fall. So now I just kind of work across both worlds, um, which is which is really cool. I worked at Bright Cove previously with Whitney and Jeff and Britta. So you'll hear Bright Cove mentioned a lot. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Felicia Jadzak. Uh, that was very loud. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am the co-founder and co-CEO of She Geeks Out, and I'm sure we'll talk more. So happy to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison grinberg Funes, and I'm the co-marketing content marketing manager at AppCues. We're a SaaS software company down by North Station that helps products improve their UX. Um, I have a very strange career background. It's definitely more of a jungle gym than a ladder, but I have a lot of culminative culminative experience that I think will be valuable. So I'm excited to talk with you all. Hi, I'm sick. <laughs> but if anybody wants to record with my sexy voice, it's available for $1 a minute. Um, hi, I'm Britta Schellenberg, and I'm a marketing executive. And like Kristen said, uh, Jeff, Kristen, and I worked together at Bright Cove. Kristen was actually one of my fabulous bosses while I was there. Um, I'm also an immigrant. I just got my citizenship in December. I'm originally from Germany. I have a little voter registration card on my uh, for Dragon. So that's very important to me. And uh, I'm at over to Jeff. Sure. So I'm Jeff Watcott. I'm currently uh, advising uh, a number of companies and consulting, but prior to that, I was most recently CMO at Onshape. Prior to that, I had my own uh, company, which is now part of Google. Prior to that, I was at CMO at uh, Brightco with several of these folks and uh, also in a variety of marketing and product management roles at various companies over the last 20 years here in the Boston area. Um, and I'm kind of in transition right now, getting involved in some humanitarian work starting this summer. So I'm ramping up on that empty nester, big time of transitions, but I was very excited to be able to be here today. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, so our first question is kind of an icebreaker question for everyone before we dive into the more targeted questions. So to get things started, um, what was the worst interview story you have? So, <laughs> uh, I could tell a few different stories uh, to answer this question, but I used to work at a mobile agency and I was tasked with interviewing candidates um, to more or less be um, the non-technical interviewer. Uh, I was the marketing team for the agency. And um, when uh, candidates that were software developers came through, uh, I was often asked to uh, interview them because most of our developers, since we were an agency, were required to be customer facing. And we wanted to make sure that they would communicate well with clients. And we had a, an Android developer come in who had built a fantastic uh, IoT product and had a great resume and I was really excited to interview him. We had built a lot of IoT products at the company. Uh, this was Ray's Labs. And he, <laughs> I asked him to demonstrate for me how to utilize the product. And typically when this happens, um, the candidate would just go into showing me how to use their product. And if you've ever interviewed before, raise your hand if you've ever interviewed anyone before. Great. So typically we know that when we ask candidates a question, uh, we more or less know the answer ourselves. We want to see how they walk us through it. And I asked the question to see how he would explain this to clients. And the response I got was that he didn't know if he would want to take time explaining this to someone with the technical know-how of his grandmother. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, uh, and, and admittedly, I was so shocked that I laughed and went on to the next question. Um, I think now I definitely would, would have more pause to 
challenge that answer. Um, but I did speak up about it in the interview review and he was passed on. Yeah. So, uh, but that was definitely the one that sticks out in my mind. Wow. For wow. lots of reasons. Yeah. There are no words. <laughs> I never found out how it worked, by the way. <laughs> Anyone else? Can you beat it? <laughs> well, this is on the other side of the table, and it's not a super terrible story, but um, so previously before leaving to start and join She Geeks Out full-time, I worked for a number of years at a tech company called VMware. I just want to preface this by saying I had a wonderful time there, and <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was in business school interviewing for an internship, and I showed up as business school taught me in a full business suit, the whole nine yards decked out. And I showed up for my scheduled interview, and no one knew who I was or why I was there. And I remember sitting there being like, hmm, okay, <laughs> this is not a good start to my interview process. And what happened, as it turned out, was the um, my future boss was stuck in Europe because the volcano had exploded oh. and there was just a series of miscommunications. And so no one knew that I was coming and no one had told me that they needed to reschedule. Um, so I ended up having a very brief interview with someone who didn't really know who I was or why I was there or what I was interviewing for. And I got the job anyway. Um, fast forward to when I showed up for my first day of full-time work after having actually um, gotten the internship and the job, I showed up for my first day of work and no one knew that I was coming because, <laughs> because the woman who was supposed to be my mentor had to go out on indefinite um, long-term sick leave and again, things fell through the cracks. So I think sort of the counterpart to Allison's story, on the other side of things, when you're thinking about the candidate experience, it's also about what is their experience like and how is that showcasing who you are as a company and organization. So as I said, long-term, loved working at VMware, but it was a very bumpy start. <laughs> Do you think business school made me laugh? Because I was thinking about this question all day and I couldn't think of like just that crazy story. But what came to me was like, I went to business school as well. So it was like, I have the pearls. I have my questions. I'm on, I got this. And I didn't actually know that I was really bad at interviewing. I didn't know how to sell myself. And I was, it was really like eye-opening for me because I got good grades. Like I felt like I did all the right things. But there were times early for internships and things where I would get passed over for people that I felt like, I think I do a little bit better than them in class. This is what's, what is this? So it was really hard for me to figure out how to interview and the, the me component of an interview rather than like just the framework of how to be a good interviewer. So I'm, I think I really started to pay attention to it differently, but early on, I think it's really hard to kind of know how to do that. So that's what stuck out for me as I thought about it. no horror stories, but just like, wow, you were bad at that, like for a little bit. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> this is one when I was interviewing uh, recently for a position, not super recently, but a, a while ago. And uh, there was someone who was on the interviewing team who I knew from, from prior uh, work who I thought actually should be a candidate for the job I was interviewing for. But she, she was not being considered for it for whatever reason. That was one of my biggest questions when I found out this position was open is, why doesn't she have this job? It was on my question. It was on my mind. And so in the interview, I asked her that question and she said, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> so it was really awkward for both of us, but I just felt I had to ask that question to know. And, um, and uh, so we, we moved on and it was a good discussion. Well, in the end, I, I did not get that job. And uh, I was talking to one of the interviewers later to find out, you know, get, uh, any feedback you have on why, why I didn't get an offer on that. And they said, well, you asked that question to that person and that caused a bunch of trouble internally. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, I shouldn't ask that question. And then I thought about it. The more I thought about it, I came out the other side. Like, I had to know, you know, the answer to that. And I don't care that it caused trouble <laughs> for their organization because they should have been asking that question. Um, so well, it, was, it was not a good outcome for me. I was glad that I at least you know, did ask it, so. Did she get the job? She did not. Mm. Right, did you wanna? No, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna dive into our questions. Um, this one's for Allison. 
go for Megan. You're first. Uh, okay. In typically male-dominated industries and roles, it's a challenge for younger women to assert themselves and exhibit confidence to move into leadership roles. How do you establish yourself as a leader, particularly when you're younger than some of the people you manage or your colleagues? This is a very challenging question to answer because I think it's something that it's one of those situations where hindsight is twenty twenty, and like I wish I could have told my younger self this kind of thing. Um, but I think that the best way for y younger folks in the industry to assert themselves as leaders is to demonstrate a sense of humility um, and and humbleness and just this uh, mindset of really being open to learning what those who are more experienced have to share with them. Um, and that doesn't always have to be somebody who is older, right? I mean, we're talking about ageism and you hear a lot about uh, people looking for mentors that are older, but people can be more experienced than you who uh, are um, at the same, the same job level who might just have a different uh, specialty or expertise. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to understand as well. Um, but remaining humble uh, in, and not being afraid to ask questions to those within your organization and also taking advantage of uh, your community's networks. I think here in Boston, we uh, are at an extreme advantage. A lot of other cities and towns um, in other parts of the country don't have the type of community that we do here, but there's a lot of opportunity. And what I've found is that if you ask, I mean, the worst, is, the worst that could happen is someone can say no, but more often than not, someone is going to be willing to step away from their computer and have a coffee with you or have a lunch with you. Um, and so it's, it's, it's worth asking for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. I'll comment. <laughs> um, I think one of the issues with, with asking that question is also the issue of competition mm -hmm. and how, how we all perceive ourselves in this world and who, where we feel like we fit in. And I think um, once you remove that sort of thought process, I should be the leader of this because I'm older or because I'm bad at this and things like that, it sort of removes that sort of tension that you might have with the people that you're working with. And uh, I think in general, like, you know, the old saying goes, show that you're a leader by your actions and uh, be outspoken, be yourself, um, that can really help you being perceived that way. But I think in general, I would shy away from any kind of competition or any kind of thinking that I am, you know, I've worked for five years, I should be at this position and why am I not at this position and so forth. So that's my thoughts on mm -hmm. that. I have a follow-up question that anyone can answer, um, but for anyone who's a current manager or leader in the room, how can they help foster confidence and leadership in their younger employees that are reporting to them? I can comment because I'm not as much. No? Go for it. So I think, um, as Berta said, demonstrating by how you act um, as somebody who has had to look for who's in the room to look up to at all, um, I've always gra gravitated towards people who seem like they're willing to ask the questions themselves mm -hmm. um, and they don't have that ego uh, where they're not always in competition and they're willing to learn and follow and sit back and not have to finally have the last word um, in the boardroom or in any type of meeting. Um, and I think that it's important to pay attention to those cues, uh, whether it's a monthly um, a sales meeting or a daily uh, stand up uh, in the scrum huddle, it's really important to make sure that you're paying attention to how others on the team are uh, treating those that you're managing and um, how the employees are responding. Um, I think a lot of times we don't necessarily pay attention to what isn't being said um, and that there is a lot of... Um, I don't want to say like strength, but uh, there's a lot of power in um, in the connotations of, of body language and things like that in meetings. So um, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where uh, people cross their arms for the entire time and 
nothing gets done, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I know, Jeff. So um, as, a, as a manager, I think one of your biggest uh, responsibilities is to spot uh, and develop talent in your organization. Mm -hmm. And so to your question, um, my, some of the most rewarding times I've ever had is when I've been able to find somebody who has talent that they don't recognize, mm -hmm. you know, leadership talent that they don't recognize, that they didn't see in themselves, and they're just like in the wrong role to do that, and then give them the role or the project and, and the kind of proactive mentorship to have them see what they can do. Mm -hmm. Because if we just depend on people to kind of prove to us how good they are, a lot of people that do have real talent just won't know how to do that, yeah. you know? And so if you make it this Darwinian struggle, like they have to kind of cross over many barriers before they even get to the point where I will mentor them, yep. you're going to miss out on some of the biggest, um, most rewarding, you know, career experiences, which is taking people from, from where they are to something higher. So I guess as a manager, you just really have to make that a priority to spot that talent. It's just, I can just tell you, if you haven't really done it, it's so rewarding. It's more rewarding than hitting any OKR that you ever, you know, could ever be given from above. The, the people, developing people is just, it's the thing I'm telling you. Love that answer. Um, okay, actually, Jeff, the next question is for you. So you can have Mike. <laughs> right. um, so when women face major life challenges, most notably, most notably uh, marriage or starting a family, there's often a perception that work is no longer a priority or the priority. This characterization is very rarely, if ever, prescribed to men. The idea that your career is suddenly secondary can be a difficult perception to overcome. As a leader, how do you address this on teams you build? Yeah, it's something I've thought about a lot. And since I saw the questions in advance, I've thought about it even more. Um, <laughs> this, this topic can, can be really fraught. I mean, let's, let's be honest, it can be really fraught because, um, you know, people's, people have life events that change their situation. But what I have learned is that the mistake that we so often make as managers and, and as men, frankly, male managers is a double trouble situation, <laughs> um, is that you, you, know, you, you like to make certain assumptions. We're like little machine learning models in our head. We take patterns that we think we've seen, and then we try to apply those to, to generic data that's flying across us to make predictions about what the outcomes will be. And that's where we're in the trouble. We're in the real trouble there. Because just like in machine learning, you have limited amounts of data, and so your model will be off. And then you'll come up with these suboptimal outcomes for people. And so what I, would, what I have learned is that on this specific issue is that when someone has a big life event, like, like getting married or having children, you just can't make any assumptions about what that is going to mean for them. Because it probably means something, but you don't know. And you have to ask them and just talk to them about it or let them bring it to you. doesn't mean like, okay, I understand you're getting married. Tell me what this is going to mean for your work. <laughs> you know, not like that. Um, but you can say, hey, you know, congratulations on getting married. You know, how, let me know how I can support you in this transition, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. And just leave the open door and let them bring it up. Because they might not bring it up at all, and that's fine. And if it doesn't, and if, it, if nothing ends up impacting their work in any way or that you can see, then it's frankly none of your business to, big, to create a big issue where there might be none in advance. So I think that the key is just don't make assumptions uh, in advance. The other thing I'll point out is that, you know, we, for some reason we've, we've, we created this lore around, oh, women getting married, big deal. Women having a children, big deal. But there's other life events that are just as significant for men and women. So like your parents, you know, having elder care you know, situations where your parents get really ill and now you got to go do something or a child having an accident. Um, and, and, you know, I had, I had an employee once that had a child that got in an accident and had severe brain damage and had, you know, needs on an ongoing basis after that. And you know, so stuff happens in life that impacts people's work and it happens to men and women and, uh, and things happen and you have to adapt and respond to it. It's not uniquely a, a you know, a, a, a women thing. And so, as a manager, I think you have to strip off the gender labels and just say people are people. They have interesting things that happen in their life. There are, those things are often 
become very important to them in their constellation of important things. And you have to adapt around that. So if you kind of genericize it that way, I think it's a more healthy way of looking at it. But I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Yeah. There's the pregnant lady. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have something to say. <laughs> I have a lot. Um, I think a couple, I, I think I agree with all of what Jeff said, but I think, and I don't want to speak for all women, but I can distinctly remember a point in my career thinking, okay, you need to hustle. You need to hustle and get every dollar you can get because the time when you decide to start a family is when you have to then settle and you have to then ride wherever you're at in your career for like 10 years while you're doing, trying to be this like unicorn of a working mother that I think is the craziest thing. So, and I, I'm not like a huge Sheryl, Sheryl Sandberg, like lean in, but I do think that book for me was very telling because it was someone saying, do the opposite. You should actually build your career and keep pushing during that time when everything about you is saying, bring it back a few notches. So that was very good for me to kind of say, okay, I don't actually have to operate in this formula that I somehow created because I thought that's just the way to do it. But I also think for men, I've just, there's been so many interesting articles around the concept of like paternity leave and how really so much of the family leave stuff is geared towards women, but men that take paternity leave are often sort of punished, whether it's out in the open or not, for taking that time to go be with their family too. And so there is like a whole other set of stigma that exists for men that if we don't, and there was, I forget the company, but they made a mandatory paternity leave policy because they felt like that's the only way we can even the playing field for someone who opts to take it versus someone who doesn't and somehow feels they should be rewarded for just staying the course. So like there's, there's to me still so much work to do here. I think women have this like whole mental model that's really hard for us because trying to be this like career person and a mother and all these things, it's a lot. And I give so much respect to anyone who's doing it and I don't know how I'm going to do, but there's a lot for men too. And I think, and especially now where the parenting relationships are so much more well-rounded and the roles at home are so much more well-rounded. I'm interested to see how we grow in terms of the male side of it too. Um, Cause I think sometimes there's more to do there. Absolutely. Can I say one more? Yeah. On this kind of failure to predict, I just wanted to say, you know, I've I've been a manager many times when, you know, a woman's come in and said, you know, I'm I'm gonna have a baby and I'm planning on this is my plan. And then they kind of tell you, you know, you obviously can't ask them to to account for their plan, but they come in and tell you I'm going to be out for this long and then I'm planning on coming back and, or I, I don't know if I'm coming back. And I've had people tell me every, everything imagine you can imagine. I've heard the different scenarios and then after the baby comes, then things change. And it just was again, another, another example to me how you just have to kind of take it day by day because even the person who's in the situation can't necessarily predict how some of these big life changes are going to affect them. Mm -hmm. Um, after, because it, it's just it's, you just don't know, <laughs> and so, and so you can't be like, well, I'm gonna rearrange everything uh, around it. So you have to try to be be as flexible as you possibly can. That's easier in a big company with lots of people, than it is in a super small team when you have people in very specific roles. That's that's harder to to work around, frankly, but you just need to be very careful about jumping 20 steps down the road around what you think is going to happen. Cool. All right. This segues pretty well into our next question for Felicia. Um, women often take the role of caregiver, which nowadays can translate not only starting your own family, but also taking care of elderly relatives or sick children, as we talked about. Um, if you take time off to be a stay-at-home mom or caregiver, how do you come back and ensure that you haven't been left behind? And you know, what should you do about it? Yeah, so as I was thinking about this question, I actually was thinking um, back to uh, a woman who spoke at one of our She Geeks Out events a few years ago who was from edX. I know there's a couple edXers in the room tonight. So this woman, Namisha, um, she was, I believe, an engineering manager at the time. And I think she's since been promoted. So I'm not sure what her actual title is right now, but awesome, awesome employee, awesome speaker. And she spoke on this topic where she had um, gone to school for engineering, I believe. She had done really well, gotten promoted. Um, and then her husband had um, gotten a job in a different area of the country. So she worked remotely for four years and then she started having children. So she took time off to be a full-time mom. 
And so I think all in all, she took about 10 years off to be a mother. And then she decided she wanted to go back to work. And so she found it really challenging. And what ended up happening for her was she got a job, but she took a a significant pay cut to get her first job back. Mm -hmm. And then she ended up getting um, an awesome job at edX and has since done really well there. Um, And what she talked about a lot was how even when she was, you know, a full-time stay-at-home mom, she was doing things and basically how do you think about the things you're doing in your personal life that you can then translate back into the workforce. And I do think there's two sides of the conversation here. So I do want to say that, so there's definitely, what do you do if you are in that position? But then also, what do you do when you're on the other side of the fence, when you're that interviewer, when you're that hiring manager, who's looking at someone who has a significant gap on their resume and is saying, okay, I haven't been, you know, in the workforce for the past however many years, but I've been, running PTA meetings. I've been, um, you know, keeping up to date with what's going on. I think there's a lot of work that can be done on both sides. If you're in that position, you know, um, I think Allison mentioned reaching out to the community, you know, once your kids are in a position where you can do this, what can you do where you're just staying in touch with the local community and building that network? Because as we all know, networks are still really important when it comes to getting and um, getting your job and getting the next job. Um, If you're in a really technical role, making sure that you're keeping on top of what's going on with the latest developments in the language or whatever else is related to your area of expertise. Um, Even just shooting your old coworkers or your boss an email every now and then and saying, hey, how's it going? Just want to update you with what's going on with me, what's going on with you. Just staying in touch that way so it's not like a, a complete disconnect while you're focusing on your family. Um, There are other things too. There's a lot of really great programs out there now. So um, there's a lot of programs that are out there specifically designed to re-ramp people up to get back up to speed. So um, whether it's a part-time internship or a part-time job or other ways of getting people back into the workforce. Um, on the other side of the fence, when if you're in the company standpoint, uh, looking at projects that people are working on and not dismissing it because it's a personal thing. Um, you know, I don't have children, but I can tell you for seeing friends and family um, who are in this position, running things like a PTA meeting is no, no joke. Like that requires a lot of work and effort. Um, You know, things like getting involved in local community efforts, uh, Girl Scouts, like there are all transferable skills that you can apply to the workforce. And so if you're on um, the side of you're looking at someone's resume, not dismissing that person out of hand. Um, And so there's a lot of things there, I think. And this is especially important as, um, we are all collectively getting older and you know it's not just about people having children and life events and things like that but also our parents are getting older and we're caregivers um, we're caring for other people in our lives people are living longer so that's another aspect and so especially um, you know gen x i think that I'm not Gen X, but they like to call themselves like the forgotten generation. But they're in this position right now where they're caring for children and parents at the same time. And there's a lot of stuff that comes along with that. And so how do we um, not only ourselves stay in touch with what's going on, but then in in the sense of as an organization or a company, how do we really support people who are in these positions? You know, a lot of times companies talk about flex work-life balance, but we don't actually live that. So if you're a manager and you have flex time and and benefits like that for your team, like live it and show that you're leaving early because you're going to pick up your kids or you need to take your mom to a doctor's appointment and don't actually say, oh, we've got flex time. It's no problem. And then everyone works 80 hour weeks. So there's, there's a lot to do on both ends. (laughs) 100%. So I'm lucky enough to work uh, at a company that does have flex time and definitely um, follows the the policy. Um, and it says something when managers uh, take flex time themselves. Uh, I have managers that I see take regular appointments in the middle of the day. They come back, they continue working from home. Our co-founders do it. Um, it it's on their personal calendar so you can see it or they'll announce in a Slack channel. Um, but I wanted to talk quickly about... 
uh, as an employee at a company or at a candidate looking to join another company, the types of things to look out for um, when you're vetting how these types of life events and transitions are viewed. Uh, and I think it's always a great idea to talk with people at your company who uh, are at different points in their lives personally uh, and also professionally. So talk to people who have been promoted, talk to people who have um, moved from remote in-house or vice versa um, and kind of get an understanding of how their management team and the overall leadership has handled the situation. Um, and you can also question your HR or people's ops teams uh, with regards to the language. Uh, I know when I joined AppQs, I had questions about about the um, maternity, paternity, and caregiver leave. Um, so I think these are important things to be observing and, and questions to be asking. Um, and in terms of preparing to take leave, um, I, I don't. I think it's done differently everywhere, but it's never a bad idea to set up some type of expectation with ongoing communications. So we're at a point in time where as somebody who works in social media can be really annoying and you're always online all the time. But the great thing about technology is we also have things like Slack groups where you can be offline for a while, but then sign on and feel like you are connected with people again. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great option for people who, um, I know I have had to be a caregiver and I've had to you know, work remotely for a while and you can get onto a team Slack group and um, still get up to date on all the meetings and all the team notes and some funny gifts and still feel like you're part of the team. So. Awesome. Um, all right, we're gonna move on to the next question, Kristen, this is for you. Um, so we've heard of the term emotional labor, which describes the experience of women assuming more administrative or nurture related tasks around the office. And so sometimes this looks like, you know, senior women volunteering to take notes, Book, book meetings, order food for everyone, or even put away dishes. Uh, I know you're pretty passionate about this, so would love to hear your thoughts on how we break this subconscious stigma. Yeah, it, we have a women's group at Localytics, and this is just like a constant topic. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good reading just on this this idea of like emotional labor that goes back, you know, tens, twenty, twenty years, but. I think there's two parts to it. There's sort of the like emotional management part that I think, um, and this is not to generalize that this is how it is for everybody, but I think some women subconsciously to sort of take on managing the emotions in a situation because we're able to sort of either subdue ourselves or you know, do something else that kind of helps the overall group flow in a way that feels better for everyone. And it's just not something I think a lot of us are even aware of. And I've caught myself, you know, we've been doing a lot of leadership training and sort of like behavioral assessments. And so much I think of me is like, I can be really measured in my communication. And so I will not insert myself if I do not feel like I'm adding value or like it's really well thought out because I'm just trying to manage the overall flow of the situation. And I don't, it's not fair to necessarily say that's a woman's issue because that may not be the case, but I do think it's a subconscious thing that women can do both professionally and socially is kind of keep yourself in check so that you don't kind of come off in a way that feels too much. Um, so I think that's one component of it. And then there is like the labor side of emotional labor. Again, I think it's fairly subconscious, but just this idea of like the operations of a company and an, and an office, there are certain things that a lot of times women inherently step up to do. And like one article I was reading again today, was sort of like, men do step up for these things. And when they do, there's like these outsized accolades of like, Joe, empty the dishwasher. <laughs> and, you know, the same doesn't necessarily carry on the other side. So again, this is not to say this is how it works everywhere. But like, if you really kind of step back, like you've probably observed things like this. And so we often talk about that moment of like, when you're in a meeting, and it's like, can somebody somebody grab, you know, take notes or can someone do this? And just having that, like, I must say yes, because no one's saying yes. And just allowing yourself to kind of sit in the discomfort for just an extra second to sort of see how it plays out. And I think also having leaders that are kind of aware of this and sort of don't put it out to the group, but sort of say like, so-and-so, can you do this? So-and-so, can you do this? Really helps. Because there is just women a lot of us are just subconsciously wired in certain ways to just operate. And so you don't even know you're doing it, but you're bearing all this extra work and you're not compensated for it. You're not really recognized for it. So it's, it's a loaded issue, I think. And I don't, I think, 
you know, there's a lot more to do, but we've talked about at, at Localytics just kind of like having that more conscious view of like, let that stay there or don't feel like you have to be the one to volunteer, you know, like a let it kind of marinate for a second and see what happens. Um, so I think that's been interesting, but yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> it's a very loaded topic for sure. Um, so actually I didn't mention this earlier, but um, she geeks out for those of you who do not know who we are and what we're all about. We do a lot of different community events in Boston, New York, and San Francisco, but we also do diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. And when you were talking, Kristen, it made me remind, um, it reminded me rather of something that comes up a lot in trainings that I facilitate where we talk about um, what we call office housework, which can be literal office housework, like unloading dishes and cleaning, but also the emotional labor aspect of things. And um, for, I know there's a couple people in the room who've actually come to some of our trainings. And so you may recognize this concept, which I'll bring up, which is the cycle of socialization. And to what you were saying about women being wired, we're all wired in a sense because we live in a society that is a product of years and decades and centuries of history of all different things going on and the media that we consume and the messages we receive. And so it's not just about women having to tamp down a natural instinct to jump in or, you know, give out, like, like throw a baby shower or unload dishes, but it's also about all of us really pitching in to do our own work to self-educate so that when you're in that meeting and someone says, who wants to take notes, either the leader or the manager doesn't ask that question and assigns thing on a on a rotational basis, so the labor is distributed equally, or um, you can speak up when you see other people sort of taking this burden on. And I want to share a really quick story and example. So I was in um, Waltham doing a training a couple of months ago, and we were talking about this exact concept, and there was a woman there who was a woman of color. She raised her hand and she said, well, this doesn't happen here. We, we don't have that happen here. We don't have that problem. And um, what was so ironic about her saying that was was earlier, I had been having lunch in the cafeteria with um, the company's head of DNI who was sitting in on the trainings. And we had both noticed that um, there were a bunch of guys who came through during lunch and left some trash and some dishes on the, on the tables. And this very woman had come in and picked up the trash, cleaned things. And she was not on the janitorial staff. She, that was not her job, but she'd come through, wiped down some tables. And it was so ingrained in her that even as we were talking about this in a diversity training, she could not recognize this in herself. And we brought it up and you know, you could see this light bulb moment, but we're, it's so deep in us. And so part of the work is being here at talks like this, but also um, you know, not putting the burden of the work of dealing with the effects of emotional labor on the people who are you know, in it, but also if you're not having to deal with those issues to step in and you know, implement practices or speak up when you see things that are happening that aren't fair, um, you know, making sure you're applying promotion criteria fairly and equally to all of your team members, not just the ones that you go out for a beer with, things like that. Yeah. Did you mind? I was just going to make a joke that I actually thought about writing a Medium article about this this week. And then I thought I'd already spent too much time cleaning up after people that I didn't want to waste more time writing about it <laughs> <laughs> this week. But I will say luckily uh, that one of uh, my male coworkers did take the liberty of shaming someone on Slack who had left their open lunch with a note that we do not reach IPO if we get roaches in the office. <laughs> So I thought that was quite funny. But uh, I, think, I think to your point, Kristen, we don't want to overly praise people for doing things that are normal and, and should be expected of everyone to clean up after yourself. But I do think uh, taking the time to maybe privately like say something like, hey, thanks for, thanks for stepping in and, and using your voice. Really appreciate when you advocate for things like that in the office um, because it never hurts to, to say that kind of kind word for sure. Awesome. Um, all right, Britta, you're up. Um, so as someone who has had a successful career navigating the challenges we've talked about today, can you talk a bit about um, that calling to help other women? Sure. Um, 
thank you by for recognizing that I had a good career. Um, it's not over yet, people. I'm only 45. There's more to come. Thus far. Thus far. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, it is so important um, to not compete with other women. And uh, I think I'm, this goes back to my earlier comment. There's this inherent um, idea that we have as women to, you know, we have to look better, we have to perform better, we have to make the best pie, we have to order the best pizza at work. Um, so be aware of that, be aware of like your, why you're doing things and um, make sure that you're doing them for the right reason. Um, and then as manager or even as peers, um, Bond with your other female coworkers, share stories with them, share your salary with them so that you're making exactly what they're making, which is super, super important. And everybody should talk about that, especially in Massachusetts when this is now the law here. Um, but also reach back. So if, you, if you're older like me and you see younger women, um, is there something that you can give back to these women? And, you know, honestly, like, I have a big issue with millennials. I'm one of those generation access that feels like I've been overlooked my entire life. So overcome that sort of, you know, your own um, way of, of, of looking at yourself and who you are and try to reach back and try to pull women in. And, you know, when you see somebody who's quiet in a meeting, go up to them afterwards and say like, hey, I just wanted to introduce myself. What are you doing in this company? You know, maybe we should have lunch sometime. Spend time with people. Um, like Jeff said, the best thing or my best experience is also um, just dealing with people in the workplace. You know, I could care less um, sometimes what the company did or, or if it went IPO because that can happen anywhere. But like the person that sits next to you and has the same experiences with you, like what are they going through? How are they feeling? Is there something that you can do to help them and, and try to embrace that sort of uh, humanitarian aspects of yourself that's deep inside of you and reach out? And that sounded really philosophical. <laughs> that was great. <clears throat> I've actually been hearing a common thread, which I, a couple common threads, which I just wanted to note uh, for this answer. But uh, one is that uh, understanding that people are human that work at the company. And I remember when I was getting into my career at, at the beginning of college and how professors would speak on and on about leaving your personal life at the door. And I think it's becoming more and more acceptable and understood that it's difficult to do that. Uh, our personal lives do bleed into our professional lives, uh, especially when you are working so much of the time anyway that they, they really do blend. Um, so I, I like that theme a lot. And I also like the theme of awareness. Um, you've touched on it a lot, Britta. And then Kristen, you mentioned the being aware enough to sit in discomfort of what is happening. And I think... Uh, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, be, learning how to practice mindfulness has been something that's um, been really important for me, understanding what actions are happening, how I feel about them, and taking that pause before I react to what's going on. Um, and as a company, we've actually started to make a practice of that as well. So we have a weekly optional meditation, um, which has been very interesting to meditate with your coworkers. Um, but it's a practice that I think is helping everyone learn to observe themselves, how they like to work and how they like to work with others as well. Uh, just a quick comment to sort of wrap up on that. Um, I think a lot of times when we're talking about women supporting other women, um, Especially, you know, a lot of us, Boston's a really tech heavy city. A lot of us, I think, work in tech in this, in this room, certainly in the city, definitely. And, um, you know, tech still has issues with, you know, representation from a lot of different groups. And so a lot of times when we're talking about women specifically, and I'm thinking relating this back to age, which is the overarching theme of our panel tonight, um, there's a sense of competition where if um, someone else gets support or resources, then that takes something away from me. Or um, I need to hoard everything for myself, so I'm not going to give advice or support. And, you know, what I like to come back to a lot is this idea of 
of a rising tide lifts all boats because it's not just about women competing or supporting with each other, but it's about everyone supporting and not having it be us trying to get our piece of the pie and, and keep that to ourselves. But really, if we, if one person does well, we can all do well together. So I come back to that a lot. Yeah. And that idea of like, if there isn't just one seat at the table, but bring another seat for someone else and help people rise up. I like that a lot. Cool. We have one more question. Are we good on time? Great. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so given everything we've discussed today, what are three actions, action items that each person in this room can do to help promote age diversity in the workplace? Um, and a couple of you, I think, will speak from like the employer perspective and some from the employee perspective. Who wants to start? Okay. So from an employee perspective, uh, I have a few. So on the personal level, like I said, uh, becoming aware of your own thoughts and actions and how they affect your direct team and overall company is really important. Uh, I think it helps in the day-to-day, -day, but also in the long term. Uh, another thing is holding people accountable. I think that it can be very scary as an employee to think that... Um, think of consequences of speaking up at times. But more often than not, once you speak up, more people will also. Uh, and it's never as scary as, as it seems. Um, and then I think the, the final one would be to um, also, it will also hold yourself accountable. And just bouncing off Jeff's point earlier, uh, when he said that uh, you can't just let people necessarily fend for themselves and, and wait to see when you're going to mentor them. But when we're talking about holding each other accountable, giving yourself accountability goals to reach. Um, and then thirdly, I would say just continually asking questions. Mm -hmm. Ask questions of like yourself and your team um, and not, not to a point of like, don't become a cynic, like not that, those type of questions, but questions that um, can help you, you, you grow as, a, as an individual and also as a team. You're pregnant. Oh, I was like, I can go first. Oh my God, who's getting it? <laughs> um, so I have the employer side, so I can balance that and then you can come back. Um, so I think one thing on the employer side is I, this phrase always kills me a little bit, but when you're thinking of candidates, the culture fit phrase, and I said it earlier and I was like, oh, I hate that phrase. So I think it's being careful on that sort of terminology. And when you are interviewing something or someone or evaluating a resume, not sort of boxing them in and saying, especially with startups and tech companies, like the, the age can skew a little bit younger. And so if someone comes across your desk, that's 20 years experience, it can be easy to be like, oh, I don't know if they'll fit in with, with the crowd here. And it, it, that should just be irrelevant. Like, and that's the other point I would say is this maintaining a focus on the greater good, like the greater mission, the greater good, the makeup of how you get there and who makes that up should not matter. It should just be the best people that will help you kind of push to that mission. And so that, if that's someone who is fresh out of college, great. And if not, you know, that, that should be the case. But I think if you don't have a good sense of that, you know, greater purpose for the company, it can be easy to just keep hiring the same person over and over and over again because they fit in well. They're a good culture fit. Um, so that's, those are things I think of as just in the role that I'm in of trying to be really careful of, not just continuing to bring in a profile of someone who we feel like, oh, they slot in super well. Like you want that sort of cohesion, but you also kind of want people that push the envelope and kind of do counteract the people that are there because that's how good stuff happens. Um, so I think that's one thing on the employer side. And then I think about as, as an employee, considering the fact that you might feel like I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't offer advice to somebody or no one, no one wants to hear my experience. That's so far from the case. If you consider how meaningful it is for you to hear from people about how they've gone in their career, how they've gotten to some points, consider that you can be that for someone too. And so you can kind of promote that diversity and you can kind of share and have that role. But I think it can be hard, especially for women, to kind of not be so humble and to try to actually share and kind of promote that diversity and promote the experiences that you've had. All right, I'm gonna actually go first before Britta because we'll do a little bit of bouncing because we have an uneven number, but I'm also on the employer side and I had to take notes because my bad joke is I have the entrepreneur version of mom brain, which is what I call trash brain. So I cannot remember anything. <laughs> 
hence the notes. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about on the employer side was similar to what Kristen said, don't filter people out by age. Um, I always think of this story where um, a couple years ago I had attended a Grace Hopper conference and there was a woman who had shared in a, I think it was a Slack or some kind of chat leading up to it where she had been selected for a scholarship from one of the companies that was exhibiting and attending at Grace Hopper, but she was uh, a year or two outside of the age range that they had put in place for this scholarship. So that they were looking for 18 to 22 and she was 25, something like that. And she was just saying how shocked she was that, you know, this was something where before they knew how old she was, she got the internship or the job, whatever it was, no problem. And the minute they found out she was two years older, it was rescinded. And that's always stuck with me because what should it matter what the number on your driver's license says? Um, it really shouldn't matter at all. So don't filter people out by age. And again, with that point too, especially in tech, we tend to really sort of glorify college, new college grads, but there's so much experience that can be had. And I'm not saying that new college grads don't bring anything to the table, but we need to value both youth and experience on a level playing field. And a lot of times, um, you know, especially for young growing startups, we get a lot of young people in these companies who've never worked anywhere else. So it doesn't even matter how old they are, but they've never even had any experience working elsewhere. And then that can lead to toxic cultures. And so it's not even about how old you are, but do you have experience working with different types of groups and ge geographies and dynamics? And what can you bring to the table from that regard? Um, second thing was... Uh, I mentioned this already, but offer flex working hours and actually live by it. Um, you can also be really creative with your benefits. And so um, my sort of personal passion has always been, uh, I don't really care about a lot of the benefits that I was given historically, but I always wanted my company to cover my pet sitting charges because I have a cat that I get a pet sitter for when I leave because he's spoiled. Um, I don't have kids, I have a cat. Um, and then the last thing is, um, in terms of the jobs that you're posting, think about where you're listing them because not everyone is on social media. And it would shock you, but I have been to conferences and summits where people have raised their hand and said, what's LinkedIn? So think about where are you posting your jobs? Are you accessing everyone who could be a great candidate? Um, how are you reaching out to people? How are you engaging with people? Especially if you're trying to get a good broad range of age within your company, maybe think beyond sort of the traditional channels that you're currently using. Now I go. Um, so I'm from the employer side, I guess. Uh, so the first thing that I would say is you are all awesome and you need to believe in your, how awesome you are and take that with you every single day, no matter where you are in your career, no matter where you are in your social life, believe in yourself because that will come out and you will shine and rise. I know this is all very philosophical again. I'm having my Buddhist head on today. Um, <laughs> I know. Number two, um, give everybody a chance. Like if you know yourself, um, or I know myself when somebody younger comes in, I'm like, oh, they don't have the experience. So if somebody older comes in, I'm like, oh, they're too old. They won't know how to use a computer anymore. You know, like, be aware of what your own thought process is and try to like get out of it, right? Try to like be aware of it. And when you meet somebody, believe in who they are and that they can contribute something because everybody can contribute something. And it is important that everybody contributes something because again, that whole mothership thing, I forgot what that phrase was, but like you're leading on a ship thing. Oh, all, all, a, a rising tide. Oh, the rising tide. I like to say. Where, where did she have? Yes. Uh -huh. So the mothership. Um, <laughs> so those are my two things. Um, I don't have a third thing, but um, thank you for having me here. So I have uh, three things from the employer side, and I just would endorse a lot of things that have been said so far. But the first thing I would say is... Um, it's really important for age, you know, avoiding age discrimination, discrimination specifically, um, to really think deeply about the value that perhaps older people bring. And I'll tell you a story just real quickly that I've learned this early in my life. 
um, I was on the high school tennis team and a friend and I would go play tennis every single day, the exact same court in a public park, the exact same time every day throughout the summer. We went into our appointed time one day and there were these two old duffers out there playing. And uh, we were kind of frustrated because we wanted to play. So we waited for 15 minutes. They were keeping on playing. So we asked them if they would uh, play us in doubles. And uh, we thought that would be a quick way to get rid of them because <laughs> we were pretty hot stuff. And so they, they, they laughed and said, sure. And so, and then they killed us. They absolutely <laughs> slaughtered us because we were focused on power and serve and they were focused on finesse and control. And they literally would make us run into each other. <laughs> they would not move. They would just stand in the same spot and just kind of reach, you know, and just put the ball exactly at low speed in exactly the spot where we weren't. And we would run and trip and fall and run into each other. And they were having so much fun. <laughs> and, and they killed us. And it, I just walked away from that realizing that the power game is not the same as the finesse game. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that so many times with, uh, in the workplace that we value activity and energy more than we value outcomes. And they're not the same. And I would rather have outcomes every single day. And you'll find that a lot of the older employees often will know how to achieve outcomes. Um, and a lot of the younger employees will be more inclined to just have a lot of activity because they don't know things. So that's not to say youngness is bad or oldness is better, but it's really easy to miss that. Um, so think about ways that your carbon-based neural net may be having a false model as it relates to older people. So that's one. Um, the next one is um, evaluating performance. I would encourage you to change the way you evaluate the performance rankings of employees. And I learned something at Adobe, which is a very mature company. I mean, started back, you know, in the late 70s with PostScript and stuff. And so it's been around a while. And so they have a lot of, you know, experienced employees, I would say older employees on, on average. And when they acquired Macromedia and I joined the company, you know, we were kind of the young Turks helping this cultural reboot of Adobe. And we thought, thought it was one of our, our you know, missions uh, as these young Turks brought in to kind of give a jolt to that culture in many ways, which we did in some ways, but I ended up learning a lot from many of the senior employees there, just learned a lot. And one of the things that they had this head of HR who would design this performance management system was the first time I'd ever seen it where you would rank employees on, a, on two dimensions. You would rank all your employees based on their performance, which is their output, their outcome in the role that they're in. Are they a master of that? Do they produce the results that you're expecting? Uh, that you should expect, you know, for the role that they're in. And then the other dimension was potential. Their, and that was their, their ability to grow, to advance in the company, and to take higher roles of, roles of responsibility. And we looked at those, and we had whole criteria and evaluation criteria that really separated those two concerns from each other. And performance was used to address salary, and potential was mostly tied to equity compensation. And uh, because we wanted to lock in people who could really advance and create a lot of value for the company over a long period of time. But what I realized when I evaluated my employees using that criteria is I had a ton of employees who were very experienced that were way high on the performance vector, but maybe weren't as high on the potential because they kind of tapped out. They were at the they were at the level that they should be in the company and they weren't going to be the CMO. They weren't going to be the VP. They weren't going to be this, but they were nailing it for what they did. They were like super experts. And I learned to really value that. And traditional one dimensional performance management techniques would have led me to not value that as much. So I encourage you to really think carefully about how you evaluate people relative to both their potential, um, you know, career growth as well as their, their performance. Um, and then the, uh, the last thing, what was it? See, I'm showing how I forget things too. I should have written it down. Um, the um, thing I would just say is that, you know, the employees who, who are, are, are older are really wise a lot of times, and you really can learn things. So humble yourself and ask things from people that are, that are, uh, that are out there you'll just learn some things. Um, I had, I've had employees that were 
unbelievably uh, just wise about how they did things in all roles in marketing, engineering. We hired a guy at my startup who was, you know, also older. Like he had programmed in almost every programming environment you can imagine, and he'd seen it all. And he knew all the the, the arch- he knew all the design patterns of pretty much any any system. And we and we were kind of, I was kind of worried about him honestly. I thought you know is this the really the right hire for my brand new startup? And we hired another guy who was right out of right out of an accelerator. He was the first guy out of that accelerator who had gotten perfect scores on all their evaluations. Unbelievably bright. So like just core processing speed, just unbelievable. But he was incorrigible. I mean he he wouldn't he was just insubordinate. He wouldn't do what we told him to do. He only worked on the problems that he thought were cool and interesting to work on. And the, and, the, and the older guy just cranked out great, clean code all day long. And I just thought, wow, that was great. So that's my three things. Think about that. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you to Workable and Whitney for putting this together and having us. Um, I now think we're going to open it up to Q&A from the audience. So if anyone has questions, I can run the mic between people. Would that be you want it? Okay. I got sneakers on. You got Oh wait, do you want to pass this down? You want to, you want to try? Can you laugh? Hi. <clears throat> I told you I was loud. Um, thank you all so much for, for being on the panel. This has been really interesting. I think one thing that's sort of missing for me when we talk about like equality among the ages, it, it's, it's almost like we're talking about it like everything is equal, but obviously people who have been in the industry for longer might require more money and like there, there's a lot that kind of goes into that and I'm just thinking of a recent example from my own life where um, we had someone who had been in sales for quite a long time and um, the salary that we're offering is quite an entry-level salary and, and this person who was like 10 years into sales was totally fine with taking it and um, and that was a red flag. Like we weren't, we weren't willing to pay more and he was willing to take so much less. And so I think like there's certain, certain aspects of, of getting an older hire on board where he might've had the right output, but, um, there's certain components of it that still make him an unattractive hire. And I I just wonder, uh, based on that very open-ended information, do you have any reaction? Thank you. Don't worry, I'll run back. (laughs) <laughs> I'll get more mics next time. <laughs> but so, um, yeah, that's a that. I mean, thank you for bringing up a you know a real scenario because that that makes it real for all of us. And I think I, I can see you know where you would come from on that. But again, I go back to what I said earlier. Like, is their output at that salary? Are, are they gonna Are they gonna be okay with that? You don't You don't know in advance, but you can check that pretty well through your interview process and through some kind of that, that probationary period during, you know, when they get hired. And with salespeople, if they ain't performing, they're out the door and they know that. So it's pretty ruthless. You don't have to, you don't have to dink around with a salesperson for a long time. They either sell stuff or they don't. And if they don't sell stuff, they're moving on and they know that. So if somebody's willing to do that, I, I would be inclined to give them a chance and see where that goes. Um, but I know in a small company, if that's your only salesperson, then you know, there, there, there's risk associated with that. But um, I don't know. I, I think it's a mistake that we sometimes assume that, a, that an older person is not willing to accept a lower salary. Some people maybe not, but again, you, sh- you shouldn't necessarily jump that that's the way it's gonna be the case. Does that make sense? It, it does. Two, two, two follow-ups to that. Today I was a salesperson, today I was a marketing director, and I was a lab. And say that I wasn't assuming they would take less. I wasn't assuming that they would take less. I knew that they would take less. Like, I don't want this. I yeah, I, why, yeah, I'll jump in super so, quick and then Allison, um, actually, why don't you go first? I'll okay. So I think um, I want to go back to something that Jeff spoke about very early in our panel conversation, which is the being careful about making assumptions and that there are a lot of things that um, as employers, employees, we don't see about a candidate's life when it goes into the decision-making process on why they take may or may not take a a job offer. Um, And especially I know in my experience, I've been in sales before, commission-based sales. Um, So 
whether or not it was a sales position. If it was a sales position, the person had the, may have had the opportunity to make commission. Um, and if the person was in a different type of expertise, um, it, it cannot always be on the employer to make sure that they are up to date on certain industry standards for that geographic area or what have you. But again, to someone else's point in the audience, um, you have to take into account that there might be a myriad of reasons as to why they're okay with, with that arrangement. Yeah, exactly that. You don't know what's going on. I've been in positions where I've willingly taken much lower paying roles because I was in a toxic environment. I had to get out. I had to do something else, whatever the reasons are. So it's hard to make assumptions on behalf of someone. The other thing too, sort of on the flip side is, um, you know, I'm a really big believer in, in paying people what they're worth. And if, you know, if you know you're underpaying a role, maybe you need to look at that and say, can we afford to have this role? Or should it be a part-time role or should it be something else? Because what I found in my own personal experience being on both sides of the employer employee team member dynamic is um, every time that I've tried to go cheap, it's backfired on me. So I'm going to be lazy and take the one right here. <laughs> um, thank you all. I um, was thinking about um, Jeff's response to the life events question. Um, and the don't make assumptions and asking the question, how can I be supportive really resonated with me. Um, but I guess one of the questions I would have for some of the other panelists is as a manager and especially um, like a male manager, it seems like answering that question is only really going to happen effectively when you've created an environment where you feel comfortable and, and safe to be able to actually respond to that authentically. So I was hoping um, some folks would, uh, give some thoughts on how can you create that environment to, to make that question really land? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off just because I have a very specific personal example to that question, I think. Um, so a number of years ago when I first started working at VMware, I had a male manager and first point was that the same, we started around the same time and he had just had a baby. And so he, from day one, as a new employee and as my manager was modeling taking flex time, which was great. But um, my experience was that I had a very significant health issue come up. And I um, remember what happened was I was in the ER, I had a blood clot, and I was a new employee and I was very motivated and I still hadn't developed a relationship of trust with my team or my manager. I called him from the ER and said, hey, I'm in the ER, I'll be in the office later. And he was rightfully so horrified and said, no, go home. What are you, like, you're crazy. Um, I went home, long story short, I had a series of other hospital stays. And so um, it was a real wake up call for me because I, I learned through his handling the situation that A, I could trust him and that he was there to support me and B, I didn't have to be this perfect employee. And we didn't really have that relationship to that point because we were still getting to know each other. We were still developing our work relationships. But after that experience, um, it really set us on a different pathway of not just, um, you know, support in the sense of getting the job done or giving me time off, but that psychological safety um, to the point where I was having issues, you know, mentally, because I basically had PTSD from having almost died. And um, he, during a one-on-one -on -one, one day, said to me, are you okay? And I broke down in his office and that was something I'd never done before. And he sent me home and he said, take the rest of the week off. I don't want to see you online. I don't want to see you here. And that was really hard for me because I had to prove that I was okay and I was great and this was not going to derail me. But I think that um, from his perspective, you know, again, we talked about bringing your whole self to work and it's not just about being a great employee or a great manager, but it's bringing it or it's remembering the human aspect of it. And I think as a manager, as a male manager, um, just bringing that humanity back to it, um, recognizing that you might not be able to relate to every single thing because none of us can do that for every other person in the world, but being open and receptive, even when your team and your employees might not be asking for that support, but sort of to just point, recognizing when they might need that and offering it or even commanding it when they're not um, in, the, in the space to do that themselves. Sorry, I thank you. I also have a very personal uh, story I'll quickly tell. Um, but just to echo off Felicia's points, um, 
I think it's hard for anyone, especially if you're new at a company, to be vulnerable. Um, but as someone who has had a male manager before, um, it's it's very important to take your entire self to work. And I remember when I started at Raise Labs, um, I had a manager who was a first time manager and who was my age and. Um, I think I was the only direct um, direct person under him at that point, but um, it was nerve wracking for me. Um, and they had also never had a marketing team um, before I joined. So there, there was a lot at stake there, um, but there was that vulnerability from the start and having the one-on-ones weekly and um, understanding like what's going on in um, my life, like my my professional goals and my personal goals. And um, I did have also some health issues um, and some family issues. And um, it was really great that there was that rapport there. Um, It was definitely a point where I felt like I had that safe safety at work. Um, And the term psychological safety, um, I haven't heard it used a ton recently, to be honest. I wrote an article about it a few years ago. Um, But it's something that uh, we all think about. We just haven't like talked about it too much. I'm hoping that that phrase will become more commonplace um, in the coming years, especially since more healthcare providers are taking uh, mental health into account. Um, but I think remembering that uh, it's okay to be vulnerable um, is important. And that also means as a listener. Um, you don't always have to be bearing your soul when you're vulnerable. Sometimes vulnerability is just being open to listening to someone else, someone else bearing their own. So this is awkward. <laughs> I also think it takes a while, a time to get to that place. And um, you, can, you can try to progress it a little bit by talking about that you're building a safe container and just be straight up with people and tell them, you know, if anything ever comes up, I'm here for you, you know. The other thing that I would say is that um, employees watch you. So however you respond to other things that might happen that may not affect that employee, they will form an opinion on you. So it's important that you continuously strive, no matter who the employee is, and it might not be your direct employee, that you are, are be known as like the sort of safety person for them and that they can come to you and talk to you. So you got that. You got it. It's like being a flight attendant. Have you ever been on a, on a flight and there's a lot of turbulence and the flight attendant's freaking out and then you start freaking out? General freak out. I was going to say one thing um, from, I believe, I, I agree with everything was said about the employer side, you know, saying, you know, if, there, if something comes up that, that's affecting your work, you know, just come to me and talk about it and we can work something out and just saying that is good. But I would also say from the employee side, it's good to be assertive with your manager and tell them about your needs. And I, I think people really worry about that a lot, but you have really very little to lose in those situations. If you go to your employer and, and, and are assertive and saying, yeah, I've got this situation going on and I, here's what I need from you. Here's what I need you to, 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 to be for me. Um, and they respond super negatively to that then you've gained useful information mm-hmm. for you to go get another job someplace, you know, and that's useful to know. And it'd be better to know that sooner rather than later. But there's a very small percentage of truly evil people <laughs> out there. And then there's a, 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 you know, a, a minority percentage of like very, very clued in people. And then there's a big middle of like kind of clueless people. And if you're kind of clueless, uh, as manager, because you're new and you just haven't been through these experiences before, you just don't have enough experience. Um, it's super helpful to have somebody come to you as an employee and be like, here's what I need you to do for me. And you're very inclined as a manager, especially if you're inexperienced and you are kind of just clueless but well intended to be like, okay, let's do it. You know, I mean, that's, that's how I, I learned uh, a lot of these things is just by having somebody having a, you know, a real experience with it. So, as an employee, I think owning your situation and, and being assertive with your manager can only pay benefits in the long run. Hi. Um, so as soon as I saw this event, I was like, oh, I have to go. And it was pressing on the 
um, in November, I had a conversation with a really close friend of mine and um, we've known each other since we're 20. We're now in our mid thirties. And he said something, we were having coffee and he was like, are you worried about getting older in tech? And I was like, what the, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> and he's in law. So like for him, he feels like he's too young, but I laughed it off. And then he was like, no, but seriously, are you worried about getting old in tech? Like, cause like I keep reading all this shit about it. And um, I was like, I haven't thought about it maybe because I dress like a 16 year old boy 90% of the time. But um, I did make me think about how companies are representing themselves like on their website and as you do walkthroughs. And so I kind of wanted to hear what are things you've seen or what do you think um, you would recommend companies do when you get older candidates and you, they see things like work hard, play hard. I fucking hate that shit, but sorry, I'm swearing. Um, uh, or like, you know, they go down or, or you'd give them an office tour and it's like, you go, I'm a, I'm, I'm a salesperson. Like you go through the sales pit and it's like, you're automatically like turning them off, like without, and like, without even realizing it. And I probably did that when I was 24 for all I know. How do, how do, how does leadership foster an environment that's like, Hey, we can have fun, but we don't have to be like, crazy all the time, particularly when we have candidates to increase diversity. Because I'm, I'm, I've heard of people who are like, yeah, I really liked it, but like, I just don't think I would fit in. And, and that sort of like bums me out a little bit that we lo- that companies I've worked with that I love lose out on that. Yeah. Um, I, I just joined AppKeys in late October. And so I went through the interview process and was having similar thoughts as I was viewing companies. As a marketer, marketer marketing and sales are often together. And so I, I saw a lot of interesting environments, a lot of experiences where if I saw the phrases crushing it or killing it, I was like, oh, red flag. Um, but I think we're in a really interesting time um, in our society now. So as you mentioned, your friend is in law. We see a lot of male law partners who are in their 70s or even upwards still working. And we don't see that with women, rarely. And, but we're getting to the point where we will begin seeing women working um, through their 60s and 70s. I mean, hopefully people will be lucky enough to retire, but who knows? Um, sorry to scare you. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think that there is a lot to be done uh, with regards to messaging. Um, So uh, something that is really exciting to me as a marketer is that a lot of companies are taking into account their employer brands. So not only their brand as a company selling to their customers, but also selling to their employees Um, because it's a candidate's market right now. Really, there is a lot of hiring going on and they have the decision of where to go. So a lot more companies are putting time into uh, their messaging on their websites and their job applications and also doing user testing and looking into the analytics behind um, behind their uh, their different web pages. Um, with regards to the to the walkthroughs, something that I felt always uh, was really effective for me was the experiential interview. Uh, where you're not only meeting uh, a series of folks for one-on-ones, but you are coming in for a company-wide meeting or a team lunch, or maybe you join a team outing or team dinner um, to get a sense of that rapport. Um, And it doesn't always help solve the issue of the age um, and uh, the dynamic, but it does help give a true... Um, a truer look at what that dynamic will be like. I don't know if you probably have a suggestion. Yeah, I would say we were, Localytics is like a reformed hashtag crushing it culture. Like those days are behind us, but that was the company that I joined and that I agree, like you see that everywhere. I think a lot of it really has to come from like the DNA of the company and also from the top down. So like we've, we've really kind of shifted how we hire, how we learn and grow people to be around like meaningfulness of their work and the ability to kind of be in a role that's bigger than maybe they've ever been in. And they're not like hitting up against this hierarchy that's just like not motivating. And so that's really changed the whole dynamic of the company. Like there's so much less of that. I don't talk about perks in any interviews. I ask people, what are you looking for in terms of uh, what's a rewarding culture for you? Because I want to hear them say back to me, I want this sort of experience of being able to grow and being able to take on things and having that ability to go be scrappy. And it's not about 
fear. It's not about, we have all that. Everybody has all that. But I do think a lot of companies lead with it. And it's just to me, noise. And I think, so I, I think you have to kind of like shift the DNA of your company to be around. I want this to be a rewarding place where if people are here for six months or six years, they're going to walk away and be like, wow, I really learned a lot from those people around me. I really took something meaningful away from this experience versus, oh, they had unlimited vacation. It was awesome. Um, so I do feel like that is sort of changing, but there's still just a lot of that. And I think it's sort of a personal choice for you to say, is that sort of the vibe I want or am I looking for something that's a little bit different and, and being able to evaluate and sniff out like, hmm, I think this might be more of that other side that I'm not really looking for. But we've been really, really intentional about trying to shift into something that really has like something in your gut feels meaningful about your work and about the people here. And if that, and you can leave at five, you can leave at 10. Like there's no sort of that whole like hang out and play ping pong for six hours. Some people do that. Um, but that's not what I do. So I think you can kind of make what you want out of it. But I love that question. So I think that might be all the, all the time we have for today. <laughs> um, so thank you again to all of our speakers.